Hello, everybody. Hi, this is Judy Maddox. I am chair of our local Western North Carolina Sierra Club, and I want to welcome you. As you know, our Sierra Club programs have switched from live to uh, concern for your safety, our safety because of the virus, and we're now on Zoom. Our first program was last month regarding uh, our Nantahala Pisgah Forest. This program, as you know, is wonderful. We are right in the middle of our beautiful wildflower season in Western North Carolina. Uh, the program is from Scott Dean, our naturalist and storyteller. But I do want to share uh, some slides with you. So I want to tell you that we are being hosted by North Carolina uh, the Sierra Club uh, for the entire state, it has three priorities, which is number one, clearly climate change, in particular, Governor Cooper's Executive Order 80. Number two, ready for 100, which is all the local initiatives for cities and counties for 100% renewable energy, which as you may know, both Asheville City and Buncombe County have passed and are beginning to fund 100% renewable right here. And number three, our own wonderful Pisgah Nantahala Forest Revision Plan. We are working on that and trying to help. So our next program next month, it's always the first Thursday of the month at 7 p.m., will be on electric, vehicle, electric vehicles. The future is now with our own Dave Erb, who is an automotive engineer. Uh, and the advanced registration link is right now posted on our website, which is Sierra Club Western North Carolina, winoka.org. Dave will describe the most viable path to sustainable transportation and explain why vehicle electrification is essential and address some of the misinformation and disinformation that dominates the public discourse. Ample time will be allotted for audio uh, for audience questions. So please join us for next next month. I'm going to ask your help uh, for the forest. As you know, last month we did an extensive program on Nantahala Pisgah, and I'm going to mention that in just a minute. But there are two other action alerts regarding our wonderful forest that we need your help on. Number one is wood pellets. As you may know, Europe, through some misconception, believes that burning biomass uh, is a better choice than fossil fuels. They don't realize that they've created quite an industry incentive here in our southeastern forests in North Carolina and all the southeast to turn our forests into wood pellets. So we need you to go on our website at the bottom. It says winoka.org. Look at the red button that says stop the wood pellet industry. And you will be asked to please deny the new application for a new wood pellet plant in Lumberton, North Carolina. It's called Active Energy Groups. And also while you're writing, ask them to deny. This is the Division of Air Quality. You need to do this by May 27th to deny any expansion of any wood pellet industry in North Carolina. It destroys our forests. It creates harmful emissions. It impacts marginalized communities. The second request I ask for you on our forest is regarding methyl bromide. Uh, this will be to the Division of Air Quality and it has to be done by tomorrow, May 8th. Again, at the bottom, it says go to winoka.org. Again, another red button. What methyl bromide is, is a chemical for fumigating these logs, in particular for export to China. Now, most countries around the world, except the United States, have banned the chemical. But the Division of Air Quality is asking to regulate this methyl bromide to a small amount. Please do support their ask but please do ask them to find, there are alternatives out there that are viable and ask them to ban it, period. Then turning lastly to our wonderful Nantahala Pisgah Forest, the comment period has now been declared ending by June 29th. 
That gives us another month and a half or so to write. Again, go to our winoka.org. Again, another side button. And you can comment and write as many times as you choose. We have many recommendations in our website, and we will send the letter for you if you would like. Number one, please support Big Ivy and Craggy National Scenic Area. I'm sure many of you in this area know Craggy. It's our Craggy Picnic Area and all of that acreage. There's 8,000 acres that are being recommended for wilderness, but now there's another 8,000 making a total of 16,000 that would then be grouped into what's called a National Scenic Area the Big Ivy Craggy National Scenic Area. Please write that you support this. The second thing is ask to write that old growth be defined. Right now there's no definition for it and some of what we consider old growth is in areas that are could be logged. So ask them to write clear standards to clearly define what is old growth and make that unsuitable for logging. As well as please support all the wilderness recommendations, the extensions for the wilderness, the backcountry, our heritage area, our special interest areas, make them clearly managed for unsuitable for logging. And now I have the privilege of introducing Scott Dean, who is our wonderful naturalist. He has done a number of programs for North Carolina Arboretum. He has been on the pilgrimages with uh, UNCA and also Smoky Mountain uh, National Park. And Scott will speak to us for roughly about 45 minutes. When you have questions at the very bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. You can click on that button, you can write your questions, and at the end of Scott's presentation, I will read him your questions. He will do your, his best to answer in 10 or 15 minutes. I, and we will try to get to all the questions that we can. So please welcome uh, in your heart and in your silent hands, uh, our wonderful um, Scott Dean. Thank you, uh, Judy. It's a pleasure to be here. As always, I'm delighted to help and work with the Sierra Club. Um, I'm hoping that uh, this goes pretty well. I uh, am a bit of a Luddite, so I, I hope the machine doesn't eat me during the course of this. I would like to say if you enjoy this, I maintain a Facebook page called Western North Carolina Naturally. I would certainly invite any of you that are interested to come along and check that out from time to time. With that said, I'm gonna to hop to hopefully my wildflowers and we'll do my presentation. Let's see, share. And the slideshow, and I want to close it, start. Starting out, we're not looking at a wildflower, obviously. What we've got here is an, part of an explanation of why we have the diversity in this region we do. One of the primary reasons is the last glaciation. About 13,000 years ago or so, the Wisconsin glaciation, the glaciers made it to right around where my cursor is moving, right around the southern terminus of the Great Lakes. They, they in fact, dug and created the Great Lakes. Now, if I'm a plant up here, and let's say that a small mouse eats my fruit and distributes my seeds, even a mouse can stay out ahead of a glacier. So as the glaciers came south, the mice or whatever the pollinating vector were, were moving south in front of it so that uh, uh, they would plant a nice new population of it. And then as the glacier moved and it got colder, they moved a little further south. And they ended up, many of them, down in our area. Now, as the glaciers retreated, those animals to stay in the cold started moving back north with them but some of them used elevation. By climbing up to the higher mountains, they stayed in an area where the climate and conditions were right for them to grow. And those are glacier relics. And they play into uh, our biodiversity. Another reason is our rock type here. We are in an area of highly metamorphic rock, which is very erosionally resistant. 
the surrounding areas uh, eroded down quicker than we did and are lower than we are. Another factor of this is that these rocks as they uh, erode and, uh, and are degraded by time and weather is that the soils become very acidic and they tend to support specific types of plants. One of the reasons our rhododendron do so well here is that we are very acidic. Most people estimate, uh, and the number's going up with all the biodiversity studies being done, that there are over 4,000 flowering plants along the Appalachian Escarpment. And the Escarpment runs basically from Asheville down into the northern part of Georgia. Some of these areas, because of the lift, get 100 inches of rain a year. So we get the southernmost of northern species, we get the northernmost of southern species, and when storms come in along the coast, many of the eastern uh, birds and animals are driven this way and carry seeds with them and plant them. So we get a really tremendous variety of wildflowers in our area. One of our earliest blooming ones is bloodroot, Sanguinaria canadensis. Uh, let me warn you now about my Latin. I had a professor once say that he did not believe Latin and West Virginia could coexist peacefully. Um, these bloom so early in the year, and we'll often have them in bloom in March, uh, very early April. And they're one of the few things that are blooming when, when they are evident. Um, the reason this plant spent the energy to create a flower, those beautiful colors and the aromas, is nothing more than to attract a pollinator. These little plants are yelling, hello sailor, here I am, notice me. And any insect that's out at that time of year, that early in the year, that sees these bloodroot is going to fly to it looking for nectar. Over evolutionary time, this plant has figured out that it need not waste its energy producing nectar because just its visual attraction will cause the uh, insects to come to it and do the work it wants. Again, the whole reason for that uh, flower is to, to get pollinated, to uh, spread the gen genetic imperative is as active among plants as it is among us. It is a poppy. It is quite rightly named bloodroot, as you can see here. Uh, it's been used in many herbal uh, remedies uh, and is effective. It's been shown to be effective against various bacteria. Tom's Natural Toothpaste included it. I don't even know if they're still making that. But bloodroot's one of our very earliest bloomers. It's one that I get very excited about. My students, I'll look forward to the ooh, ooh, it's the bloodroot dance that I do the first time I see them. But about the same time they're blooming, we have these lovely little creeping bluets. They are a northern species. We tend to find them up high down here. Uh, they're in the uh, genus uh, Houstonia. I will not try the Latin. Serpilifolia is the genus. I did try it. And they're just gorgeous little things. Another common name for them was Quaker ladies. I'm not sure where that originated. Quite possibly, I should think it is from the uh, beautiful coloration on them. Uh, people have accused, uh, not accused me, but have said you must have photoshopped those colors. And believe me, I did not. Uh, about my extent of my uh, expertise with Photoshop is to crop a photo. We have a plant here is a, a pressing of one, and this pressing was taken by Andre Michaud. Michaud in June of 1787 found this plant down along the uh, bottom of the escarpment. And he took a pressing of it and took it back to Europe with him. He never saw it in flower. He didn't name it, but he took that pressing back to Europe and about a hundred years later, Asa Gray, in the 1840s, so 70 years later, was in Paris and saw this uh, particular uh, pressing in an exhibition. If I were pressing plants today, I would put a GPS location for where I saw the plant. Back then, he said in the mountains of Carolina, which covers a lot of ground, but Asa Gray had been in the area for quite a while and he had never seen it. He got curious about it. He came back and he looked he paid people to look, and it took uh, 30 years before it was found again. And it's known to occur in the wild, naturally, in only seven counties. Uh, and they are on that South Carolina, North Carolina uh, border 
with one disjunct population up near Old Fort. But this is the flower itself. This is Shortia, the Oconee Bell. He named it after a friend of his, uh, Charles Short. But it was thought to be extinct until they found it. It apparently transplants very easily, um, which leads to the question why it's so uh, geographically restricted. And I've never read an answer to that. But it is, I think, one of the prettiest little flowers we get. And this is my favorite shot, and I have taken a thousand of them. Another early spring bloomer is hepatica. When I learned this, it was hepatica acutiloba, and now it's been changed into anemone. As we're doing a lot of genetic work, or the, the serious scientists are, we're discovering that a lot of our classifications were not necessarily correct. As the original people doing the classifying could only do it by visual cues. It has this in common, it has that in common, so it must be related. And now with genetic work, we're finding out that that's not necessarily so. A lot of times, uh, um, filling the same niche will lead to a lot of similarities in an appearance. But a beautiful little spring flower, which a lot of people call liver leaf. You can see here the foliage on it. At one time, the human liver was thought to have three lobes. As it turns out, modern medicine we know now, it has four lobes. But the doctrine of signatures, if you've ever heard of that, was an old philosophy that everything on the planet had been put here by God or your gods, depending on your, your culture, to serve man. And if you knew how to read God's signature, you knew how to use that plant to your, your benefit. That um, was thought, to, the doctrine of signatures was thought to originate in China but it made its way to Europe. I'm gonna read the name because I haven't got it memorized. Um, in the early 16th century, Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, who took the Latin name Paracelsus, introduced the concept to Europe. And they ate it up with a spoon. Uh, going along the unity of nature, it just fit in nicely. Um, in 1883, the belief that this would help was so strong that some 450,000 pounds of these leaves were kept, gathered, dried, and processed and made into various totally ineffective treatments for liver ailments. So the doctrine of signatures is a good story. I would prefer to have my medical care based on science. As the season changes, a young frog's fancy turns to thoughts of love. About the time we get our very first warm spring rains, sometimes as early as late January, wood frogs, Rana sylvatica, come down out of the woods. The males will come down and for three or four days they will gather in these vernal ponds and small ponds. I've heard their singing referred to charitably as an out of tune banjo. I wasn't aware that you could tune a banjo. Uh, sorry, Al. Um, but in a few days, the female comes down and joins them. Now, these guys normally live up in the woods, and you never, excuse me, you never get to see them. Uh, but the, she's attracted by the singing, and she comes down. And the males will fight over, often to her great discomfort. They can really be dangerous. But then the male will climb on her like this. And if you'll notice the distended abdomen down here, that's full of eggs. And he has he develops nuptial pads on his forearms and they stimulate the release of the eggs into the water where he will then uh, fertilize them. Um, she'll lay up to 2000 eggs. Depending upon the temperature, the eggs will hatch in about two weeks and uh, the tadpoles will metamorphize in about two months. Um, soon as they've laid the eggs, though, they turn around, they go back up into the woods and you've not seen, you don't see them again until the following year. Um, their reproductive strategy is opposite of ours. Theirs is lay a ton of eggs and fertilize them and hopefully one or two of them will make it. They don't invest the parental care and the time that uh, we and many mammals do. Foam flower, 
This is one of my favorite little ones, and you'll hear me say that probably four or five times during this presentation. Tiarella cordifolia. Uh, the genus name is from the Greek for tiara because of the uh, uh, shape of the pistol on this. It was said to resemble a hat that the, uh, the Turks wore. It has a very high tanning content. American Indians used the leaf tea as a mouthwash and an eye rinse. The root was used as a diuretic and to treat constipation and as a poultice for open wounds. Mostly, I just think it is a stunning little thing, as did this West Virginia white butterfly. And again, the plant's being rewarded for having a flower because in order to get to the nectar, the pollen is captured and disseminated and the system works like a charm. And Dutchman's britches. I love these little guys. They are another northern relic. They're more commonly seen up north. So down here we get them in our uh, higher elevations. And if you turn that flower upside down, you can kind of see the little Dutch boy in his pants with these wooden shoes on hanging upside down there. By hanging upside down, they protect their uh, pollen and their nectar from being dislodged accidentally. It's a very close relative of squirrel corn. Squirrel corn got the name uh, apparently because the root resembles roughly a, a, a very misshapen uh, ear of corn on the cob. These are in the genus Dicentra. And our old timers in this area, the early uh, Europeans who arrived, weren't fond of it because it contains alkaloids that disrupt the uh, human or mammalian central nervous system. And they called it staggerweed. If their forest pastured cattle and livestock would get up into it, they would often come staggering out of the woods and fall over dead. It is potentially poisonous. Some people have used it as a hallucinogenic. Um, and it's just not one I care to try. The confusion between the two, uh, I think once you've seen them, you'll, you'll quickly uh, lose that confusion. But if you'll notice on the squirrel corn, how tight the spurs are to one another and rounded with a little tinges of purple here. And the Dutchman's britches, he's taking a very wide stance and has this lovely gold here. And these are fairly representative size. That's my wedding band. So you'll get a feel for how, how big they are. They are a first cousin also of bleeding heart. One we get in the area in great profusion is the uh, spring beauties. They're in the genus Claytonia. This is the Virginia spring beauty, commonly just called the, the spring beauty. And you'll notice that the foliage on it is long and grass-like. Whereas the Carolina spring beauty, and here it is, and you'll see how the foliage is a much wider blade. Uh, the root on it is edible, supposedly tastes a lot like chestnut. I have never tried it, um, but I don't think you would hurt the population. Everything you see here that looks white are spring beauties blooming. When you find them, you tend to find them in great numbers. This was taken this year on the Mountain to Sea Trail out of Licklog Gap, our colloquial, I love the names. We have a variety of orchids. Not all are really showy, but the ones we'll look at here tonight are. This is uh, the showy orcus. It is one that the, the genetic studies and the renaming and more, more accurate names, this went from being orcus spectabilis to being uh, Galeara spectabilis. And I, I prefer the other name. This is one that's pollinated frequently by bumblebees who will go up into the flower the pollen sacs, the anthers, if you will, are, are uh, adhesive and stick to the bee. So when it comes out and goes to the next plant and goes in to, for more nectar, it does the pollinating. We have the purple fringed orchid and uh, we also have the, the fringeless orchid. The purple fringe, the large and the small are very hard to tell apart. The primary way to tell it is the opening down into the nectary is circular on the large flowered and is shaped like a dumbbell on the uh, small flowered one. But if you see a bunch of these growing along the side of the roads, they're just absolutely gorgeous. 
probably our best known orchids. Oh, here I'm jumping the gun. Here we have a yellow fringed orchid. This is probably the most widely spread one. And it wasn't until uh, um, recently that uh, um, we had figured out the pollination schemes on these. But that is just, I love the fringes on it. They're delicate. Our, our probably better known ones are our lady slippers. And this is the yellow lady slipper. If you'll notice here, the big, huge opening at the top makes it easy in and out, very easy access, really easy for uh, an insect to get in and do it. Till 1994, they were considered a European species, but then they uh, were recognized as a separate and valid species. There's still a lot of discussion, uh, sometimes heated, regarding the uh, status of them. 19th century Americans used it as a sedative for nervous headaches, hysteria, and female problems, which I assume were the men. I don't know what a female problem is. Uh, American Indians treated toothaches with the plant. Too much of it, though, can cause hallucinations, so it's not something to go messing around with. Our other, and more commonly seen in my experience here in the woods, is the pink lady slipper. Um, remember I showed you uh, on the uh, yellow lady slipper that huge opening at the top of the labellum? Well, on this one, you'll see right here, that's the only way out. They enter through a small slit between these two lobes of the labellum. The insect does, but to get out has to come out through here. And it's arduous. Not all of them make it. University of Maryland studied a stand of 3,000 of them and only one third of them flowered in a 16 year period. And only 23 of those were successfully pollinated in 16 years. However, the average lifespan of these is 20 years. And when it is pollinated, it produces up to 60,000 seeds. So you can imagine they're very small and they have no food supply. Most seeds, nuts, seeds, so on and so forth, if you're eating an ear of corn, the good milky stuff that you taste so wonderful, it's called endosperm. And it's actually there to be a food for those individual kernels of corn until they can uh, germinate and grow, an energy source. Well, these little seeds on these lady slippers do not have any, any food supply. And unless they land in an area where they can quickly become associated with a specific fungus and a mycorrhizal relationship, they will starve, they will die. The plant literally cannot feed itself without that fungal relationship, which is one of the reasons that poaching them is so infuriatingly pointless because they're gonna die. As soon as the amount of uh, fungus in that soil is gone, unless you happen to plant it where there's more, the plant can't feed itself. It's just, uh, if you have it in your mind, if you've seen it out in the woods, you've, you've got it where it should be and the, the best place for it to be. They are wonderfully beautiful little things. And we think orchids, we think of all of these exotic, beautiful things. Sometimes you can find great beauty just looking down. This is just red clover. And if you look at it up close, you can see that it is a member of the pea family. Each of these are individual flowers and they're just stunningly pretty. And they are um, cl clovers and peas, they're often used as cover crops because as a pea, they help fix nitrogen in the soil. We cannot utilize atmospheric nitrogen. These plants will take it in and through bacteria that live in their roots, they will convert that and put it into the soil, which will help our plants grow and provide us the nitrogen we need. But I always try to put a few ordinary things in a program just to, to say, keep your eyes open. There's always something to beautiful to see. I highly recommend if you're a, a plant geek like I am, my email is nature geek, to buy a little jeweler's loop, a seven or 10 power. You see them using checkout coins. Some of these things, if you look at them under magnification, will just take your breath away. Not everything that blooms and is beautiful in the spring is a wildflower. This is the flowering dogwood. Beautiful trees, they don't get real big. They tend to be understory. This was the, uh, the Easter tree to my grandmom. 
if you looked around here, these were the blotches, these were the wounds in Christ's hands and feet from while he was hanging on the, the cross. And while he was there, Jesus realized and God realized that the tree felt horrible for being used so foully, so it was never grow big enough again to be used so evilly. That was God's gift to it. And while it may not get real big, it certainly can be beautiful. If you go out and see these things against the sky and look for them, they're just stunning. I would say, you know, that tree doesn't grow over there, and I was told to quit being smart. We are blessed with a wide variety of trillium here in the area. This is trillium grandiflorum, and these flowers, when they open, are all this pristine white. And as they age, they discolor and turn this pinkish purplish colors. Now, I've heard it proposed that, you know, it's telling a plant, it's telling the insects it's already been pollinated. But as one of my professors explained to me, well, why would you care if an insect came once you've been pollinated? You don't mind if they come visit. Apparently, this is just oxidation. But if you'll notice on a trillium, you have three leaves, you'll have three sepals, and you'll have three petals. They're really trillium. Here is the wake robin. And it has both this more typical red form, it has a cream color and a white color. I don't have a good photo. Trillium erectum. Uh, this was birthwort. It was used as various concoctions of it. Uh, a root tea was used to treat menstrual disorders and to aid in childbirth. And they shared that with the early Europeans and it became known as birthwort. Wort being uh, an old Saxon term for a plant and quite frequently denoting some medical usage of it. Um, you can eat the leaves, but picking them will kill the plants, so I don't recommend that you do. But this is Wake Robin Trillium, Trillium Erectum. And here we have the purple toad shade, Trillium cuneatum. You'll notice on it that the, there is no stalk uh, under the petals. The petals, the uh, sepals and the leaves all arise at the same point. It was called a purple toad shade because of the modeling on the uh, leaf, which if you have a great deal of imagination, I guess could look like the skin of a frog or a toad. Um, I love the night sky, I love the winter sky. And Orion's wonderful, it makes the winter sky pretty easy to read, but I do not see a celestial hunter there. <laughs> you gotta apply your imagination to these things. In the toad shades, we also have this little yellow one. This is Trillium luteum. When I was in school, I went, I went to school and got my degree after I retired from the Air Force. And when I went to school, these were all called Trillium sessile and were considered one species and the different color was considered just ge different genetic uh, expression. And now we have seven or eight different toad shade trilliums. They, they still call them toad shade. Sessile again means without having a stalk and that's based on the flowers not being stalked. So as the science changes, so does the Latin and uh, I can't keep up with it. Saw this one just last week down along the Little Tennessee River in the Needmore tract and this is Vastes trillium. Like the large flowered trillium, this blooms white and the plant will turn this color, the leaves will as it ages. But the difference is this will hang down underneath the leaves. It droops and the, the uh, large flower does not. And down on that section along the need more, we must have seen five or 600 of these things. It was phenomenal. And my prettiest one, this is my favorite. This is the painted trillium, trillium undulatum. And again, a really good example here, you've got three leaves, you've got three sepals, you've got three petals, three sepals, and three leaves down here. And if you would look closely, I, this really doesn't show it, but it is a three-part ovary as well. So the term really is trillium, if you're gonna be correct. We get the little bluebirds in this area. They're nesting at the moment. Um, 
This guy's six to seven inches tall, and uh, the average adult weighs 1.1 ounce. They are tiny little things. This was taken uh, at my home in Asheville when I lived there. I had an S box out by my front gate, and I was leaving, and this little guy was apparently waiting to go in and feed his young, and doesn't he look like he's tapping his toe saying, you know, get out of my way, let me go take care of my business. Beautiful little birds. The Navajo thought that two of its cousins, the Western bluebirds, nested on each side of the door of the home of the gods. And I think it would be a pretty good little escort to have. Another nice little flower for this time of year is bishop's cap or miterwort, mytelodiphyla. It's a saxifrage, actually. It's got these two leaves down here, diphyla, two leaves and these beautiful flowers. Now, again, if you carry your magnifying glass, your little uh, lens with you, and look at them up close, you'll see these wonderfully fringed petals. It's just a beautiful little plant, wonderful flower. And there's wild ginger. If you look closely, you see here how these two leaves are common. Down at the base of them, you'll see the little flower. And if you go in and look close, there is the flower of the wild ginger. We have another group of plants called hexastylus that behave similarly in that they, they grow down like that. And again, I have heard some people refer to them as wild ginger, uh, at which point you can talk about common names and there is no incorrect common name. If it's the common name you use, then it's, it's as good as the common name I do. This is not a true ginger. Ginger is actually a, a, a tropical fruit, but the root on this does have a somewhat similar taste and used to be chopped up and boiled in simple syrups. And then uh, people would use them as throat lozenges. And I have tasted them and they are wonderfully tasty your flowers down on the ground. So what's going to be your pollinator? You know, most things want to be up above the leaves and want to be seen and have the pretty color. Ants are one of the primary vectors that pollinate these guys. They are also one of the primary means by which the seeds on these get dispersed. These spring growing plants, one thing about them you'll notice is that they're all very small as a rule. They're small, they're brightly colored, they have strong aromas. They don't have time to get to grow up to be big, tall plants. They have to attract a pollinator. And often when these guys are out, the pollinators aren't real numerous. So you've got to be the really showy one. Again, hello sailor, you wanna be the one that gets noticed. They have to get fertilized, they have to produce their seeds and they need to have their seeds distributed before the canopies fill in. Because when the trees leaf out, these guys are deprived of sunlight and they lose a lot of their energy source, their food source at that point. So this guy has been successful. He or she's been pollinated. She's got seeds produced that are ready to go. Ants will come in and they take these seeds out with them. The seeds are covered in little pockets called eliosomes. And these eliosomes are full of sugars and starches and ants just find them irresistible. So they clean the shell off, the seed off, but they're not strong enough to pierce the coat. So when they're done, they just drop it. And if that seed can germinate and pollinate, then it'll go from there. It'll grow. And that's the primary means of uh, getting the seeds dispersed. It is called, and I'll probably pronounce this incorrectly, merkekakori. And it's uh, called, it's Greek for ant farming. So it's pretty fascinating. Some trillium do it, some violets do it, but things with low flowering plants, it's a good system to have devised. Here is one of my favorite trees this time of year. This is, these are the flowers on a black locust. And black locusts are members of the pea family. And this particular one produces, in my opinion, the most delicious honey that we get regionally. It is just knock your socks off. The Cherokees had a legend about it. And uh, Annie Dillard wrote about it in one of her books. Um, let's see here, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. 
in long racemes of white flowers hung from the locust trees. Last summer, I heard a Cherokee legend about the locust tree and the moon. The moon goddess, goddess starts out with a big ball, the full moon, and she hurls it across the sky, spends all day retrieving it, and then he, she saves a slice from it and hurls it again, retrieving, shaving, hurling, and so on. She uses up a moon a month all year. And along about spring, of course, she's knee deep in moon sh shaving. So she finds her favorite tree, the locust, and ha hangs the slender shavings from its boughs. I think that is wonderful. But you can see the pea flower form on this. The standard, the keel, the wings. Another really pretty little locust, and it's more of a shrub, is the bristly locust. You can see wh whence the bristly name came. The locust wood, by the way, is extremely hard and rot resistant. I have built raised beds out of locust lumber and had it bend 16 penny nails. I mean, you have to pre-drill it to be able to use nails or screws or fasteners in it. And it is beautiful. Wood sorrel. This is Oxalis Montana. It is the same family, if any of you have grown them or gone to Ireland and seen them, as the shamrock. This little guy, I think, is the prettiest one we get. We tend to find it at high elevations. Again, I think the Montana may uh, come from that. Um, just gorgeous little things. The, the foliage is full of oxalic acid. If you're from an area that has it as a kid, you probably ate sour grass and got that sour taste chewing the leaves. Well, that is uh, the oxalic acid in it. We had cousins that would visit from up north. We'd take them out, we'd eat it all day long. We told them it was sour because squirrels had peed on it. But we didn't know about oxalic acid at the time. Black rat snake. We saw this guy during one of my classes. This is uh, one of the largest and most widely distributed uh, snakes we get in the area. It'll grow up to 85 inches. Uh, it's found throughout the state and in the mountains up to about 4,500 feet. It'll lay five to 25 eggs uh, in the springtime of the year, um, rotten logs, sawdust piles. The young emerge in late summer to early fall. Rats and mice eat most of their diet. They're really a good snake to have around if, if you do. Uh, I had neighbors in Asheville, my de facto grandkids, if any of the days are watching, hi guys. Um, I'd often hear a knock on the door and Charlie would say, you know, we've got a snake, will you come get it? So I would go move the snakes from them. This one we saw on a wildflower class. Normally I would get it and we would help pick it up and talk about it. But you notice this very hairy vine that he's laying on? That's poison ivy and he was absolutely safe for me because I do not mess with that stuff. Another example of not needing to be exotic to be beautiful. This is a blackberry, Rubus alleghaniensis. It's a member of the rose family. Very typical for rose families are five petals and a ton of stamen. Asa Gray, again, the, the guy who was looking for the uh, uh, hepatica, categori categorized some 200 species of brambles, many of which look like this. Uh, not all of which produce a good edible fruit. Blackberry fruit is wonderful. And about August time frame, we go out picking them. Here we're up very, very high. This is a little stand of Canada Mayflower, Myanthemum canadense. It's a glacial relic. Again, when the glaciers retreated and uh, the animals followed it back, carrying the seeds and so on, and uh, getting it back up into its original ground, these guys went high. I had a professor who referred to this as the principle of elevation, in that every thousand feet you go up is roughly equivalent to 250 miles northward travel. So if you go up 4,000 feet, you've effectively traveled 1,000 miles north. We do have southern, uh, examples up at Roan Mountain, there is a little sinkafoil, the closest to other population of it we know of, is uh, in Nova Scotia. And it, it just stayed down here and at these higher elevations, 
uh, is able to hang on. This is the flower if you look at it up closely. Those of you who know false Solomon seal or Solomon's plume as people currently call it, I'm not gonna change what I learned to plant as because people are afraid it would hurt the plant's feeling. Uh, this is, that's false Solomon seal. They recently recategorized that into this same genus. Beautiful little flowers. And again, if you have your hand lens with you, you can take a look and check some of these things out. Another one that is above ground, a big, big tall thing, and not big tall, but a taller thing is the redbud tree, Cercis canadensis. This is the Judas tree. Uh, old timers would tell you that Judas hung himself on one of these and Prior to that, the flowers were white and they all turned red with shame after that happened. If you look at the flower up close, you can see again, it's another member of the pea family. These flowers can put them in your salads in the spring. I've had them in fritters um, and they're gorgeous. They bloom, if you'll notice, the flowers come directly out of the twigs and the bark. This is called cauliflory and this is the the only example I can think of in our area that does that, it's fairly common down in the tropics and it serves an advantage to the plants that do it in that they can be pollinated by anything that's climbing up the tree and going up after the nectar and so on to get to the food is gonna do the pollinating. So it works out well for the tree. Starry or fringe champion, excuse me, I always confuse the tree the two, Silene stellata, the pink family. I always thought the pink family came from the name of fire pink. And here is the fire pink. But the name, the pink family comes from the fact that all of the petals are notched as if somebody had taken pinking shears to them. Here again, you can see how, how notched these are. So the pink family has nothing to do with the color. Although the fire pink is stunning. I, I consider it the, uh, the flagship of the group. And this will be very long lived in its uh, uh, flowering. You'll, you'll find these in flower sometimes into August at the right elevations. Again, with our elevations here, you can uh, extend your seasons. You start spring down low and follow it up the mountains. And if you want us to do your fall, you start up early because you'll have You'll have fall plants like goldenrod and so on blooming in, in late July and August up high and then follow the season down the mountain. Another reason that makes this place so much fun for me. Birds, again, the pileated woodpecker. Um, this guy is our largest one around here. He's fairly common permanent resident everywhere in the state except for the Piedmont area. They get up to 19 inches in length, weigh up to a grand total of 10 ounces, which is hard to believe when you look at them. They mate in February and both sexes will dig a, a nesting hole. They might use the same tree year after year, but they're gonna dig a new hole each year. And they dig them in a rectangular shape. So if you're out looking and you see a big rectangular hole dug beaten into a tree, it's a pileated woodpecker has done it for you. Um, it's fun to watch him. He's listening right there and he'll hear something moving in that dead branch and then he will go after it and attack it and, and get it out. Um, what I'm, <clears throat> studies have been done. You know, if you're flying a aircraft and it does a really hard bank, you suffer these G forces, the effect of gravities. And these guys, when their heads hit the trees, can be up to 1,500 Gs, and they are designed to withstand it. Uh, a really, uh, really gung-ho fighter pilot that can, can maintain through eight Gs is considered a hoss. So these guys are really cool, and they have a long barbed tongue that will go into the holes they dig and pull out their prey. And here we have the windflower, or wood anemone. Beautiful, you see the five petals. They're actually sepals, but we won't go into that. They're petals for our purpose. And down underneath it, they'll have usually a, a, a series of three leaves, each of which is divided into three leaflets. And they're toothed like that. 
and that makes them fairly easy to identify once you get your eye into them. Again, uh, uh, a northern species that has uh, stayed down here at higher elevations. We get a variety of different rhododendron here, again, because of the acidic soils. This is the, <clears throat> excuse me, Catawba rhodod, excuse, the Rose Bay rhododendron. It's the one that grows down at our elevations here in the 2,000, 3,000, 3,500 feet elevation. Beautiful white flowers. Beautiful pink buds that will open into those white flowers. An interesting thing about them is though that they're toxic. Honey made from them is, is toxic. It's quite unpalatable. You could never eat enough of it to make yourself sick because it tastes awful. But uh, I know beekeepers that if their bees get into it, they'll process a little bit of it anyway to give as gifts to fellow beekeepers. I guess you have to have that kind of sense of humor. At higher elevations, we get the Catawba rhododendron. It has this beautiful pink, red, purplish color. I'm not sure what the correct color is. They're really noted and found frequently up on Rhone Mountain in the Balds. Balds are treeless areas up above the tree line, and we really don't understand why there aren't any trees growing there. Some people uh, say that it was slash and burned. Uh, for farming by the Native American tribes, the early peoples, uh, or that uh, maybe the, the uh, elephantine species, the mastodons and so on, might have grazed it to a point it couldn't recover. I have no idea. I do know that they were prized areas among the uh, uh, early Americans, the Native Americans, if you will, uh, because they uh, provide an intersection between forest and open areas. And when you have those intersections, you tend to have a great diversity of wildlife. So they were prime hunting grounds. The legend is that the Catawba Indians and the Cherokee were fighting a war over control of the, the bulbs up in the Rhone complex and the Catawba won. And prior to that, all the flowers were white like the uh, Rosebay rhododendron that we saw down lower, but from all the blood that was spilt, they turned pink or blood red. So, you know, fire pink isn't pink and a red bud isn't red. So sometimes the color names are a little weird. But these guys are so beautiful. You can find them out in the woods. I'm probably fairly tacky, but I, I like the pretty showy, gaudy things. And these guys really are that. They're just lovely. And my favorite of all the rhododendron is the flame azalea. Now, all azaleas are rhododendron, but not all rhododendrons are azaleas. This is a little deciduous plant. Uh, often these uh, flowers will bloom even before the, the leaves are out in the spring. You see how the style and stamen come out so long? Those are it's very distinctive of them. And it wasn't known until fairly recently how they get pollinated, <clears throat> since everything is out here so far away from the the petals and the corolla. And it turns out that butterflies, swallowtails in particular, when they hover, their wing beats will pick up the pollen and then distribute it on the next one. And again, walking out through the woods and taking a look and seeing these guys, it's just always a joy to see for me. They're probably my favorite of the rhododendron, unless I'm seeing a really pretty Catawba at the moment. Here's a little tiny rue anemone. Again, a small little thing because it's got to have everything done before the leaves fill in. A lot of times we just get beautiful, beautiful features here. As you change from the sedimentary rock down in the Piedmont, which butts into the escarpment and come up, you have the fall zone and you get these beautiful waterfalls. This is a small one called Shakawankan Falls. It's down near Columbus, North Carolina. Um, there's something about the sound of moving water. I spend a lot of time in the woods and backpacking and camping, and it's the greatest white noise there could be. Another really small little guy. This is wild stone crop, sedum ternatum. It's a succulent. It's a those of you out west, if anyone, any of my friends from out in the, the, the west are uh, looking, the ice plants that they plant along the roads there, uh, 
uh, are succulents. They are sedums. They do well without a whole lot of water because the plants can store the water in these fleshy leaves. And again, if you carry your hand loop with you, look what an intricate and beautiful little flower that is. It's just amazing to me the variety and what you can see. One of the things that stands me in the most stall, perhaps gives me the best perspective of it, is when I realize that none of that is because of me or for me. It's just, it simply is. And I find that so many of us are fascinated by it and appreciate it and uh, are concerned for it. One of the, the, the more redeeming signs I see about us, sometimes I think maybe Darwin got it wrong. We get three bellworts. Uh, this is wild oats. The genus is Uvularia, Sassifolia. Think about the uvula hanging down in the back of your throat. That's where the genus name came from. And again, with the doctrine of signatures, it was just, well, by golly, this must be good for treating throat ailments. And it doesn't do a thing. It doesn't do any harm either. Sometimes the wrong plant is not a good idea. It's why with my students, I never tell them, I never advise them to go out and, and eat these things or try anything because if you don't know what you're doing, you can go to the next zone real quickly. So this is the wild oats. It's the smallest of the three that we get. This is the large flowered one. And you can see here, he's got a suitor. You'll notice that the stem tends to pierce the leaf. Well, a couple of them do it. This is the large flowered. And this is the perfoliate bellwort. And it's an even a better example. I was leading a, a photography club through a botanical garden and one of them had a black backdrop and I decided to try that behind this and was really happy with it. The, the perfoliate and the large flowered, as you can see, are, are fairly similar. <clears throat> Excuse me. The easiest way to tell them apart, and hopefully you can see it on this slide, do you see how granular and dusty it looks along the inside of this? That tells you that this is the perfoliate bellwort. Being perfoliate, that is the term for when that stem seemed to pierce the leaf. So we get three of those, and again, tons of it has been used uh, for an ineffective, various ineffective treatments for throat ailments. Excuse me, I had to have myself a drink. <clears throat> this is a little oxide daisy, one of the ones that we get. Um, this is not native. In Europe, this was considered a scour scourge. It has an awful aroma. If you, uh, and I did this once, not before I found this out, but I gathered a bouquet of these on my property. And a little while later, my wife was looking at me going, did you bathe? And I was like, well, yes. Uh, and it turned out, no, you don't want to do them. They would fine you in Scotland uh, if you had the most of them on your property of your neighbors, you would get fined normally a ram. Chrysanthemums though, that is the court of the Japanese empire, just for your knowledge. I think they're pretty little things. I love this one with the water on it. I was very happy with that photograph. Here is a white tussock moth caterpillar, white marked tussock moth caterpillar. This guy's gonna turn into the most nondescript, boring little uh, brown moth that you've ever seen, but he is quite, quite attractive, I think. Um, very hairy, which is a warning to uh, uh, predators that you probably don't want to mess with them. Not all of them do sting, but many do. Uh, this guy is in fairly bad shape. He's been parasitized, so he is not going to be long among us. And I doubt he made it to the moth stage, but boy, isn't that pretty coloring. And here is a little yellow stemmed. This is daughter or love vine it's called. And it's called love vine because it will wrap anything it encounters up. It's a parasite though. The reason those vein, uh, the vines are orange is that it does not do photosynthesis. 
It's living off of uh, uh, other plants, uh, root systems, and so on. If you look down the throat of it here, if you count them technically, you'll see there are five. It is actually in the morning glory family. And it binds via a process called thigmotropism, which sounds to me like something Monty Python would say. But when that vine hit this upright, the cells that are in contact with the vine, with the upright, shut off and the water goes to the cells directly along opposite it, which elongate. And that forces the spiral motion, thigmo for uh, touch and tropism for movement. Heliotropism, the plants that follow the direction of the sun. Uh, again, helio sun, tropism for movement. The wildflowers in the spring are phenomenal. We get into them in the summer. Um, once that's done, though, there's not much to look at around here. This beautiful fall color is the highlight of the year for me. I love the spring wildflowers, but after a hot summer, when autumn arrives, I get very, very, very happy. Uh, I think it's just amazing. Here we've got asters, sourwood trees, goldenrod, these beech trees, birch trees, just beautiful. My favorite shot I ever took in the autumn was where, when I lived in Asheville, and this is on the Asheville M Municipal Golf Course. Uh, and it was just a beautiful October morning. Uh, I feel very blessed to live where I do. I am uh, totally uh, fascinated by all of the good stuff that we have in nature. I would encourage anyone that can, when it is safe to do so, to get out and walk and look and observe. I will hope that all of you remain safe and that you remain well and that we all get through these rather strange times. Um, I'm sending my best wishes to all of you and hopefully, Someday soon we can share a sunset set like this one down at Lake Jonaluska. And that's what I've got. So I'm going to thank everyone for joining. I hope it was worth your time. And I guess we'll go now to Judy and we will see if we had any questions, if I can stop sharing. Yes, I did. Are you there, Judy? I'm here, Scott. Can you see me? Yes, I can. Oh, good. Well, you got a lot of compliments on your humor, sir. People have enjoyed and have laughed. And you've got a number of compliments in that um, people want your recordings and they want your slides and they're interested if you have captions on them. Uh, do you have that on your Facebook somewhere or would you like to send those to us? Well, if they, uh, I have too many to do that. I, most of them you can find on Facebook, but I'll have them in albums where like I will say, okay, the, I was out the other day up high in the, the, the uh, uh, black balsams. So if you go to my Facebook page, Western North Carolina Naturally, go to photographs and look for albums. And then as you go through them, anytime I have a picture of a plant, I'll have the name of it up as well. Great. Um, second question is um, about pink lady slippers. A couple of people said that they've had good luck with blooms for, my gosh, 20 to 12 years. But the last season, this season, the last couple of years, no blooms. Is, are they doing something wrong? Not necessarily. I think those things tend to be very, uh, uh, I won't say cyclical, because I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason to it. But uh, think again about that University of Maryland study. In, uh, in uh, 16 years, only uh, a third of their population bloomed, and only 24 of those were pollinated. So they just are hit or miss. OK, next question. Can bloodroot be added to your garden, and can it be bought at local nurseries? Well, you would have to find a native species nursery. Uh, a lot of the more commercial places, if, if I go into a nursery, I have to have my wife there to help me because I'm pretty okay. good out in the woods, but nursery wise, I am not too, too sharp. I'm pretty sure that like if you're uh, regional here to North Carolina, or I'm not sure what their mailing do, but Carolina Natives Nursery up near Burnsville, 
I have gotten stuff from them in the past, but you're going to have to find, I think, either someone that has it growing on their property or a nursery that uh, uh, deals in native species. Okay. I actually didn't, I failed to answer the last question about recordings. We, the, you are being recorded. We are going to post it on uh, both our uh, North Carolina Facebook, uh, Sierra Club North Carolina, and there will be a link from YouTube and we will post it on winoka.org. So all of your wonderful fans can relive every minute of tonight. <laughs> Well, thank you. I will, I will look for that. And then I will let the, the people on my Facebook page, on my nature page, uh, I will send them that uh, link. And I'm very appreciative of that. I'll, I'll get the chance to see it too and listen to myself. That's right. And stuff. Uh, next question. What time of year do the Oconee Bells bloom? They are very early. I would expect to find them in mid to late March at the latest. And what elevations uh, are the yellow fringe orchids? Uh, they're pretty widely dispersed. You can find them down, in, down at 2,000 feet, and you can find them up at 4,500 feet. <clears throat> they are probably the most widely distributed uh, of the, the lady slippers here in North Carolina, or the orchids. What is a saxifrage? Saxifrage are a group of small plants. It's uh, you got to go back to the old King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And that's just telling you what family they're members of. Do black locusts have thorns? Yes. In fact, the uh, genus, the, the species name for them is uh, Robina pseudoacacia. If you think about the acacia tree with the big thorns there. So that is where the name came from. And they will get you. Those are some, those are some stout and sharp thorns. I would love to know where Scott finds all these flowers. Uh, Scott stays out in the woods as much as he possibly can. And over the years, I've been doing this now. I retired from the military in 91, moved up here in early 92. And I have been walking, uh, keeping records. I have trail reports from many trails, different times of the years. One of the things I do, if you're on that Facebook page, I'll do a little self plug here. I, uh, I hire out to take people out, depending on what they want to see and when they do. And I work cheap. Is showy orcas an orchid? Or why is it called showy orchid? It is an orchid. I, if you recall, I showed that with the showy orcas and the purple fringed and the yellow fringed and the lady slippers. Those are all the orchids. Why do blackberries grow around poison ivy? Poison ivy grows wherever it wants to. I think it should be the state plant. <laughs> there's, there's no affinity between the two. It's probably because you want to get the blackberries and you react to poison ivy that it seems that that does to you. And how about trailing arbutus? I've been looking for it and can't find it. Well, we had a pretty good year for it this year. Uh, again, it's a fairly early bloomer. One of the, the earlier ones we will see around here in March, in uh, maybe very early April, they might hang on. Um, I think it's just a matter of being persistent. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really 100% sure how widely distributed it is outside of the mountains, though, to be honest. Can you transplant bloodroot? Yes. I recently uh, moved some from my wife's property uh, out in Balsam, North Carolina to my place here in Waynesville, and uh, it's doing nicely. Uh, is the daughter plant a native? You know, I don't honestly know. I believe so, but um, again, for that one, uh, go to my Western North Carolina Naturally page on Facebook and leave me the, send me a message via that and I will answer it for you. Is mountain laurel part of the rhododendron family? Yes, it is. Calmia latifolia. It was named after Linnaeus's uh, a tutor, a student and, uh, of his who tutored his children. 
And on flame azaleas, is there anything that can be done to keep the green gloppy wads of bacteria or whatever it is from forming on them? It is a bacteria and I don't know of anything. I don't know that it's particularly harmful, but it is quite unsightly. Do you have a favorite reference book for native flowers and trees? Well, <clears throat> I have probably 75 of each. Um, for my classes here in our area, I use a non-technical key called Newcomb's Wild Guide to Wildflowers. And for trees, I use Swanson's Trees and Shrubs of the Southern Appalachians. Uh, Alan Weekly of uh, UNC recently was part of a nice new one, uh, I think Flowers of the Southeastern United States, um, that is uh, quite nice. Trees are more technical. Trees are not given to a non-technical key like Newcomb's. And as I tell my students, even with Newcomb's, uh, you're going to question its parentage on occasion. <laughs> it takes, it, you got to be persistent. Well, Scott, we want to thank you. This was a delightful way to spend the last hour or so. Uh, people are saying they miss you, they miss your classes, they miss being with you, and they I'm have- I'm flattered. So thank you kindly, and we will see you next month for electric vehicles. How about that? That sounds like a winner. I, I hope to have one before I'm through here. Again, let me wish everyone, please be safe, be responsible, and take care of yourselves. Thank you, Scott, and good night. Thank you. Good night.